Good morning. Welcome to the live stream for Southside Bible Church. We live in a country where we get to open up the Word of God. And I, for one, hope that I'll never take that for granted again, the privilege to gather together in one location. I want to really give our hearts this week to pray. Uh, Proverbs 21.1 says, The Lord holds the king's heart and he turns it wherever he wishes. And I, I just want us to intercede and ask that God will turn our governor's heart to open this up for us next week. So let's uh, beseech the throne of grace as a, as a family, a body of Christ, and ask God uh, to move in that way. We're currently studying through Romans. If you'll turn there, Romans chapter 3. I think we're in one of the most powerful passages of Scripture this morning. In Romans 3, uh, verses 9 through 18, I'm going to call it a portrait of the human heart. There's a story that's told of a man who was walking through a park one Saturday afternoon, and he's carrying a small New Testament in a leather case. And thinking the case contained a camera, a group of young people asked him, would you take our picture? In response, he said, I already have it. And when they were astonished, these youths said, well, well, when did you take it? <laughs> Where'd you get our picture? And he pulled out his New Testament and he read Romans 3, 9 through 18. He said, there's your picture right there. This morning, I'm going to show you your picture from God's camera and lens in our natural state apart from grace. And it's a picture that cannot be photoshopped. Facebook, there's these little things that you can make your picture look perfect for the most part, and you can hold cameras from an angle that make you look 20 pounds lighter, and, and it, I, I call that the law. It, it, you're trying to fix things up, but it doesn't really work. You might fool somebody, but you won't fool God. This photograph that we're going to look at this morning cannot be fixed up by anything human. But Paul is laboring because of the gospel that he's unashamed for. It's a power to make your portrait to God the Father be His glorious Son, full of righteousness, a picture that is perfect, all glorious within and without, the radiance of His glory. It's God the Father looking in a mirror and He can see Himself and all His reflections reflected back as we are in Christ. This morning, the bride from hell could become without spot or wrinkle before its bridegroom. The hope and remedy for the condition that I am going to show you this morning. I want you to take a look at, at the portrait from the master photographer, the creator of all who knows your heart. It's the truth about the condition of your heart. This is God telling you what your heart is, and it's not going to be sugar-coated. It's the reality of mankind since the fall in the garden with Adam and Eve. It's why the world is as it is. It's why this world is so broken with racists, the strong exploiting the weak and COVID falling apart. It's why we are as we are. It's God's description of mankind apart from his saving grace. And it's a dire picture. It's a hopeless picture that God will paint for us this morning. And Paul says in verses 19 through 20, it's, it's to shut our mouths and to make us accountable before God. It's to lead to the only place to find healing and remedy. This condition allows us to do nothing but hold out an empty hand as a beggar and say, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. When you're done with this picture, there's no other remedy but an empty hand looking to Jesus Christ. And that's my prayer, and that's how I want to start our service this morning. Father, I pray You've said, Jesus, that you would send the Holy Spirit and he would convict of sin and judgment and righteousness. So Holy Spirit, do that work this morning. Let everyone see the depth of their sin. Let them see that their righteousness is a filthy rag before you and that they stand on the brink of judgment. That's the great problem with mankind, not riots. God, that is the human heart. That is the need this morning. And I pray by the grace of God, Holy Spirit, do that work in any who will hear these words. God, do what no human being can do. Save to the uttermost. I pray this morning. Amen. 
Donald Gray Barnhouse about this passage says, it's only stubborn self-pride that keeps man from the confession of God that would actually bring his release. But the, the way that God is given to bring the release, he refuses. Man stands before God today like a little boy, he says, who swears with crying and tears that he has not been anywhere, anywhere near the jam jar. And who, with an air of outraged innocence, pleads the justice of his position in total ignorance of the fact that a good spoonful of the jam has fallen right on his shirt, under his chin, visible to everyone but himself. This isn't me. This is not a picture of me. And the jam is all over you this morning. Paul knew that mankind wanted to deny this truth in our fallen state. We don't want to hear this. And we have a whole structure in our world built to push this away and say, woo, I can't hear you. This is not the truth about me. And so Paul has been arguing from creation to show you. He's argued from history. He's argued from reason and logic. And he's argued from our very nature and from conscience and now this morning, Paul's just going to argue from the scriptures. He's going to pull out the Old Testament, and it's just going to be like machine gun going boom, boom. If there's anyone tottering just a little bit to be saved, and you still got a little vestige of goodness in you, this morning is to just finish you off in love so that you would fall upon Jesus Christ and be saved. Romans chapter 3, verse 9. <clears throat> what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we've already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. What then? Go back to verse 1. What, what then advantage has the Jew? With, with circumcision and the law not able to save you, what advantage? And Paul said, great in every respect. You were given the oracles of God. You have privilege. And now in verse 9, what then? Are we better are we better than with all this privilege? Do, do we have some advantage as Jews? And Paul says, yes, you got great advantage. No, you got no advantage in verse nine. So what is it, Paul? Are you speaking out of both sides of your mouth? Well, Paul says you have great privilege. It is an advantage. You have the special revelation of God, but you have no advantage when it comes to sin and judgment and standing before this God. You have no, there'll be no partiality. You have no advantage, religious Jewish person. So you, you have advantage that you have the word of God, but you have no advantage with your guilt and condemnation before this God. Both Jews and Gentiles, Paul says, are all under sin. This is a present tense. We are all continuously under sin. The preposition hoopo for under, it means to, to totally be under the power or the control of someone or something. So all Jew and Gentiles are under the dominion and the control and the power of sin. It's the same word used in Luke 7, 8, where Jesus, this man said to Jesus, I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. Same word. And I say to him, go and one goes and to another come and he comes, do this and they do it. So the, it was like a slave being under the control of his master. We are all under the tyranny of sin. We are under its corrupting and cult cultivating, cult captivating influence. Paul says we're, we're a slave to it. We're in bondage to it. In Romans 5.21, he says it reigns over us and it was going to bring the fruit of eternal death. So I want you to hear this this morning. Sin is not so much an act or a word. But in this context, it's being under a tyranny. It's being under the reign of something. I want you to begin to feel a little desperate. It's not you do bad things. It's that you are under the dominion and the control of sin. Romans 6, 14, sin was master over you. You were slaves to it. And I want you to notice this. It was a bondage of delight. It was not against your will. In this state, you loved your jailer, you loved your chains, and you loved your master. Romans 6 says you gave yourselves fully to it, deriving benefit. The old bumper sticker that just says sinner. Or we were proud of it. We boast, in Romans 1, we boasted of it. 
So make sure you hear this. The Gentiles acknowledged their sin and gave hearty approval. Most will say, I sin, but I'm not that bad. Men will acknowledge in, in prison and under the reign of rule of, of sin and nature's night. Romans 8 says, one in this condition, he said, cannot please God. When you're under the rule and reign, no matter how hard you try to clean up your life, he says, you cannot please God. Impossible. This is the clearest picture of what theologians call total depravity. That we come into this world from the top of our head to our toes, separated from God and sinful. I've said before, it's not an S chromosome passed down, but it's a defilement of a reigning, ruling master called sin. And it affected every aspect of our human existence. Paul's going to say, it darkened your mind. It made your affections for the world and your will was enslaved to do the will of the devil. Ephesians says we are dead in sin, but not alive to God. All who are believers have a toe tag on that says I once was dead and sin. And so this section is the condemnation section. I think the worst proclamation you could ever put over someone is under sin. Because the wrath of God, Paul has shown us, will come because of sin. It's what God hates. His holy character, there's a revulsion to sin. It's what brings us then under God's judgment is sin. And now we're being told we're all under its dominion, its rule, and its reign in our life as we are born into this world. Well, pastor, what if I don't like that picture? I think we've all had that picture that makes you look as bad as you could possibly look, (laughs) right? Yet, uh, maybe it happened to be your son's wedding. (laughs) And and, and now your sweet wife puts it up on on the mantle for all to see. And every day you sit there and you look at it and just you have to face who you are and what you look like. And you just want to turn it around or something. And then your wife turns it back. So what I want to do is journey this morning. And I just want you to look at the portrait of yourself apart from grace. The condition that I lived in for 21 years. And and I want you to see this picture clearer than you've ever seen. and, And you need to look at it and not turn it around this morning. So before I do, I just need you to get comfortable this morning. It's a long sermon. Sorry. I want to make some application from this first statement, and and it's a rabbit trail, but I think it's one that's going to be helpful. Uh, It's it's a simple one. In in Romans 1, we just saw pagan Gentiles, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. They're given over. Romans 2 were these God-fearing Jews who are trying to obey the law and be the best version of themselves they can possibly be. So please don't miss this. Paul says, are we any better? Are we any better than the guys in chapter 2? Guys in chapter 1? Both are under the dominion of sin. So whether you are moral or immoral, secular or non-secular, religious or irreligious, please hear this. You are in the same boat. 319 says that all men would become accountable to God, which means liable to judgment. We're not any better. We're all under God's judgment. We're guilty and we're going to be judged by God. And so you, whether you spend your days showing compassion and service to the needy day after day after day, or if you are cruel and exploit others' weaknesses your whole life, you have no different standing before God. No matter how different these two look on the outside, they have the same radical self-absorption On the inside. And that's just radical. Because most in our day who who are not interested in God, and maybe this morning you're, you're seeking and you're wanting to know a little bit about Christianity. And this is what you think when you begin. At least I did. I I need to start doing better. I need to do this or that. And, And God will bless me. He'll give me heaven. And I need to quit doing this or that. These bad things, smoking, dipping and chewing and going with girls who do. That's not Christianity. I want you to hear that. That is not it. This is not a call to stop doing bad things and start doing good things. Both of you are in the exact same place. 
So whatever this gospel is, it's the power of God to bring salvation. And it's more than that. It's more than just quit doing bad things and do good things. Right out of the gate, it has to be something more than that. Are you with me? Wake up. I only got 10 of you. Come on. Are you with me? Man, I need a church back. There's no other religion or worldview that says what I just said. Every religion, cults, say you got to do this or that to get deity to be happy. Christianity says that can't help you from what I'm about to describe this morning. Because your problem is internal and it's your heart and it works its way out. Jesus said you clean the outside of the cup, but on the inside it's, it's dirty and religion is just cleaning the outside and it can't fix your heart. The gospel is the only thing that can fix the inside and your standing before God. So that was for free. One more thing that's free. This is the only cure for racism. This is the only cure for pride and looking down on other human beings because it happens everywhere in our land in a million different ways. And the question is, am I any better? Paul said, no. And if you get this portrait this morning, I look down on nobody. My greatest problem with this world is me. I'm no better. And we enter now into this world with a gospel like that. And I'll love any race, any culture, any political affiliation, any different stance on (laughs) COVID-19. Do you see this? Religion causes you to feel superior to other people. Christianity causes you to say, I'm the greatest of sinners. What a cure for what our society needs. And so if I will ever help those who are truly treated with injustice, gospel alone is how I'm going to help them. Don't ignore it. Enter into it with love and with this remedy of Jesus Christ. I have such a passion for that right now in my heart. So, outline. This morning, we're going to examine eight aspects of the painful realities concerning then the dominion of sin in our unbelieving state. Unbelieving state, here's the rule and reign of sin. And it's just a simple outline. It's eight points. You ready? Who's, who's over this? Haley? Let's go. Misconduct, your mind, misdirection, Our mistakenness, our motives, our mouths, our meanness, and our misapprehension. Okay? So, put on the seatbelts. Let's go. And and it took me five sermons to do this the first time I went through Romans, and we're going to do it all this morning. And the reason is, is I I really think it's designed to be bullets. And I just want you to take in and, and see your portrait if you have not come to Jesus Christ. Listen to God's picture of your heart. But first, one more observation. Sorry, Jacques. I want you to notice, as I'm about to do this list, because this list messed with me. It says there's none who seek after God. There's none who are good. There's none who's righteous. And I would look out and say, man, there's all kinds of people doing good. And there's people seeking after God. And, and how can you say this, Paul? And it really bothered me. And I was just trying to get my arms around it. And I want to help you out of the gate if that's where you're at. <clears throat> I want you to notice in this text, That sin is relational before it's behavioral. And so he says that there's none who seek for God. All have turned aside. These are very directional words with our bent and our inclination is away from God. And so sin, like Adam, right away, it makes you move away from God and go, get away. We hide. The fall has made it where we don't want God. And as our, catch this, as our chief end and goal, a lot of people want God, but not to be everything, not to be supreme and loved and worshiped and adored and obeyed. Beginning with the the obedience of faith for the glory of God that, that fixes this with the gospel. To make God the center and joy and the delight of your hearts is what this gospel can do. But from us, uh, him being a joy and delight in our hearts, but I want you to see the gospel has made it where there is nobody who wants that. So sin makes you want to get away from God, not toward him. 
You want to hide. Chapter one, how do you hide? You, you look at creation and you suppress God and you say, get out of my life, God, I don't want you. And he says, I give you over to sin. Chapter two is you're religious and you're moral and you're trying to obey the, the law, but so you can make God be in your control. Bless us, God. Give us things. And you suppress God with religion and self-righteousness and everybody's running from God either way. Both are in the exact same condition. <clears throat> so just get what these verses are saying. It does not say this. No one seeks blessings from God. People all over America this morning are seeking blessings from God. One nation under God. I, I don't want to be mean. We were never one nation under God. <laughs> That's for later. Um, people, doesn't say people don't pray. They, they meet all over for prayer. It doesn't mean that they, they don't try to obey him. We saw that in Romans 2. It doesn't mean that people don't want forgiveness of their sins. They don't want addictions and all the consequences that come from addictions to be delivered. <laughs> the people in Romans 2 did that, but they did it from selfish ambition. And we do it to get things from God or to feel good about ourselves or to make demands to God to put him in our debt. So we, we can do many noble things and virtuous deeds, but not from a heart that loves God. I was running from God even in my good deeds for 21 years. I didn't have a lot of them, but I was running from him with them. The problem is depravity keeps anyone from seeking just God for God. That old song, do you love me for me? No one in their fallen state just loves God for who he is and all of his beauty and all of his grace and all of his glory. No natural heart will seek after that but it will seek after religion. It will seek out how not to go to hell. There, there's a lot of things that it will seek, but it will not. When he says there's none who seek for God, it means this way. No heart will ever want all of his beauty and glory and seek that. People will do good for goodness sake, but not for God's sake. So come with me now and see the portrait of what it looks like when our hearts won't have God as the center of our affections and our pursuits as the pseudum bonum. Sin has pervaded every aspect and every faculty of our life. I'm going to show you holistic destruction that only the power of God can fix. So let's move quickly. Misconduct, Romans 3.10. As it is written, <coughs> there's none righteous. What about me? Not even one. There's none righteous. No, not even one. This term is used more than 60 times in Romans, and it means to be right before God. There are none who are righteous from God's viewpoint. Human beings have no righteousness at all before God. And remember, we saw God requires a, a God kind of righteousness to be in his presence. And the, the gospel is none of you have it. No one has true righteousness. When we muster up our kind of righteousness, and come to God, Isaiah says it's just a filthy rag before him. Here's my best stuff, God, and when you see God for who he is, you're just going to be holding a filthy rag. Many will find this out on judgment day. You think your stuff's good, and when you see God, it's going to be a filthy rag. There's none righteous, not even one. I use this old worn-out illustration, but I'm going to use it again. In the Vietnam War, this was a true story. Uh, there was a platoon that was captured and they were POWs and, and they somehow got a monopoly board and they started using monopoly money in camp to gamble with and trade and barter. And there's always a capitalist. There's a Taylor Murphy in every group. And he ended up with the most money by the time they got out. And then he comes home and he, he goes to the bank and he's just smiling going, I'm here to open up an account. And the teller says, how much? He says, $500,000. And the teller looks at his money and starts laughing. It's monopoly money. My point is monopoly money had value in the war camp. But before the banker, it had no value at all. And, and, in, and in life, uh, human righteousness has a little bit of value. Some people will pat you on the back and think, hey, you're a good guy. And so there's, it's a little bit of value. But when you stand before God, it's monopoly money. Before God, it's going to be worthless. Because it all came from a wrong heart. And it's unrighteous with no value. God requires divine righteousness. In a few chapters, Romans 10, 3. For not knowing about God kind of righteousness 
and seeking to establish their own, the Jews, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. And so they tried to do it on their own and it was monopoly money. And God's saying, I'll give you my kind of righteousness, but it's by faith. And you receive it as a gift from me. There's our misconduct. There's none righteous. The mind now, it's a quote from Psalm 14, 2. Look with me in verse 11. There is none who understands. <laughs> the word understands, present active participle. There, there's no one who's understanding and it meant to bring together with the ability to comprehend or understand thoroughly. It's that epigenosis idea. There's no one who can just get this and figure out who God is and what the gospel is and who, who our portrait really is. When, when the world makes a portrait, it's always beautiful and pretty and it, it can be fixed and improved. This is, this, no one understands. It's an important statement. Because there, there, there's so much debate. How much can an unbeliever understand? Well, he can have a brilliant mind, Nobel Prizes, technology, science, mathematics, but try to understand the gospel to make men right with God and you'll never get it. You can't figure it out. You're a sinner and your deeds are a filthy rag and you're empty with nothing but to believe in Jesus Christ for his substitutionary atonement on a cross dying for your sins. It's foolishness from beginning to end. They'll never get it. When you share this at work, unless the Holy Spirit works, it's foolishness. It's moronic. They can't understand the doctrines. They, they can see no glory. I'm sorry. They can understand the doctrines, but they can't see glory in it. They're just cold, dead truths that leave your heart selfish. There's the problem. Listen to Ephesians 4. This I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. I love what Jesus said to Peter, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who's in heaven, when he made the proclamation, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ. You could have never understood this, Peter. You could have never got it, but the Holy Spirit has revealed this to you. So I just want you to come away that no one can figure this out. All of our natural thinking, you can't get this. And I, I use the, another old illustration, but I'm going to do it again, is when I was growing up, if you wanted to hear FM radio, you had to buy a special antenna. And, and if you didn't have it, all you got was the AM radio. And if you, if you, so if you wanted FM, you couldn't get the frequency no matter where you pushed your little buttons that moved it around. And then when you got that antenna, you started receiving FM transmission and the radio stations were just better on FM. And so I, I, I could never hear FM till I had an antenna. And then I, then I had beautiful music, cozy, 101. And so you, the gospel's being preached in FM. And you, you'll never figure it out with your AM mind, the natural mind. You, it'll never make sense. You can't. So I just want you to see the desperation is most of us run to our minds to figure out everything. And in this, you will never be able to figure it out. The Spirit of God is going to have to reveal to you the glory of this gospel. Luther said, our fallenness is that we do not know our fallenness. So there's our misconduct our misunderstanding, we can't figure it out. And then our misdirection in verse 11. <clears throat> There's none who seek for God. There's none who seek for him again for all of his beauty. We're all natural fugitives from God. And we have no spiritual taste buds. If you, when my kids were little, if you sat them down and said, here, do you want the ice cream or the Brussels sprouts or the kale or whatever it is that you hate? Those kids will choose the ice cream every time. And we loved sin and we chose it again and again and again. There's just no one that seeks for God. God was Brussels sprouts in our natural mind. Sin has taken beauty and the satisfaction of God in our soul alone and destroyed it. Now he's just a little cosmic bellhop. Ding, ding. God, take away my fear. Uh, get me a job. Heal my daughter. That's all he is now. God is a bellhop. So don't miss this. There's no one who seeks for God truly under sin. Only God can make God seekers. And he has done this in your heart. If he has, you're called born again. 
I lived my whole life. I, I prayed to God that I'd play good basketball in high school. I used them. All I ever did, I never prayed for anything but for Laura to have her as a girlfriend and to play good in basketball. That's a bellhop. And churches are filled in our land with people who aren't really seeking the true God. Seeker friendly is we'll give you all the trimmings without God. Sin. There's none who seek for the true God and cry, cry out against my remaining sin that continues to draw me away from God and, and the lovely one. But in our unredeemed state, we will never seek God truly for all of his beauty and all that he is. We can't see that. There are none who seek for God. Verse 12, our mistakenness. All have turned aside and together they've become useless. We kind of took God for a test drive, and I hear it all the time. It didn't work. <laughs> I didn't get a bellhop. I lost my job, my health. I'm done with them. We've turned aside, and this is, this is a, a word of the will. We, we chose to turn away from God. I will not come under you because I'm under sin. I can't. I already have a master. I can't come under you. So Isaiah 53 says, we all have turned aside. We've gone our own way, which is what? It's away from God. And when you go away from God, he says, you become useless. That Greek word was rotten fruit or rotten milk. And I don't have to get into that because if you've ever tasted any of that, you know, we've all, we're just rotten fruit. You turn away from God. That's what you become. We were made for God's glory. Our usefulness is in living what we were made for, to be image bearers of God. That's what we've been made for, and we've rejected God. We willfully turned aside, and I want you to hear this. We're good for nothing if God isn't at the center of our hearts and our lives. You're like a bird who is trying to swim all of your days, or a fish who spends all of your days trying to fly. They're good for nothing. If they don't do what they were made for, they're good for nothing. They're rotten fruit. You were made for God. And you exchanged Him and you traded Him for other things. You turned aside from how you were made and how you were designed. And you feel useless because you are in this condition. You can never function right. And you're just rotten fruit or milk before God. So there's our misconduct, our misunderstanding, our misdirection, and then our mistakenness. We turn from God. Now I want to look at our motives in verse 12. <clears throat> There's none who does good. There's not even one. What about Red Cross and Habitat for Humanity and the Dumb's Friend League? How about a husband who works so hard for his family? A wife who has sacrificed so much for her kids? What about a soccer mom? Come on, pastor. There's evil people. I give you it. There's mass shootings and abortions. There's evil people, but it ain't us. We're good people. We're voters. We vote and we're, we mow our lawns and we, we're just nice. We give to charity. But I want you to hear God's assessment of us. There are none who do good. Not even one. And again, it's not external acts, but the internal reason and the motive for why we do it. Why do you do what you do? Is it because of the beauty of God in this gospel? I have neighbors and friends who will lend me a rake or make cookies or one, one guy, I love him, he plows my driveway on big storms. Bless his heart. He can't be unsaved. <laughs> There's no way. But talk about this passage in the gospel and every time I see something else. I had a neighbor once, he said, I just live by the golden rule. And I explained to him what that was, and he never talked to me again. <laughs> We're all good until the true gospel is brought to our heart. And, and, and you will see then what God says. We're, when we're all under sin, there's none who does good. Do you like the portrait so far? Well, now it will manifest this internal mind, affection, and will it will manifest itself in actions. Jesus, should, out of the heart flows the springs of life. 
And now he's going to show what that produces in our actions. And the next point is our mouths. And Paul's going to address it in, in four parts. And I'll just read them to you. Um, in verse 13, their throat is an open grave. And with their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Paul's going to address it in four parts. <clears throat> the throat, the tongue, the lips, and the mouth. And Jesus, again, from the heart, the mouth speaks. What, what fills our hearts will fill our speech. We live in the day and age where there's so much concern about harmful emissions. And so is Paul. <laughs> Paul is concerned about harmful emissions called our speech. And we go into this world and we poison the atmosphere with our tongues and what we say. And first, he says, their throat is an open grave, an unsealed tomb with all of its putrefaction, just awful, smelly speech, a throat with speech that comes from it that reveals the death and the stench on the inside. The foulness of our, wor of our words testifies to our spiritual death. And it just fills our world, our internet, our phones, our politics, this pandemic, talk, radio. Everywhere I look, it's just, it's evil. And it just, just slow down and listen to all the harmful emissions filling our land. Are you adding to it? With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The original Greek meant tongues that are very smooth. They tell falsehoods and they're flatterers and they pretend and they deceive. What a description of our society. Look at your office and dinner parties and government offices. We're just so friendly and we mutter things when the back is turned. All the people acting as if they're fond of one another and leave and slander each other. That's life, whether you live in royalty or rags, that's just our day in our land. The whole thing is built on deception. Listen to what Jeremiah said in chapter 9, verse 3. <clears throat> and they bend their tongue like their bow. Lies and not truth prevail in the land, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, declares the Lord. Let everyone be on guard then against his neighbor, and do not trust any brother, because every brother deals craftily, and every neighbor goes about as a slanderer, and everyone deceives his neighbor and does not speak the truth. They have taught, they have taught their tongue to speak lies, and they weary themselves committing iniquity. Not a pretty picture. The poison of asp is under their lips. This is a viper who was poisonous and deadly. The poison was concealed in these little bags at, at the root of their lips. And, and the upper jaw of the adder would, would, had close to some fangs and it would lie in a horizontal position. And when they were ready to pounce, he puts back his head and these fangs go down deep and he bites the victim. And as he bites with the fang, one of them presses the bag that's full of poison into the wound and the venom is injected into its victim to kill him. He so says, that's what our lips are like, our tongues. Slander and bullying and name calling and degrading cultures and colors of skin. The truth of man is a smooth tongue, but under his lips is venom. And their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Proverbs 15, 28, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked just pours out evil things. Cursing was intense malediction, desiring the worst for a person and making that desire public through open criticism or defamation. Bitterness was the emotional hostility against an enemy. Uh, this is the person you've met them. They're just nasty and they're bitter and everything they say just pours forth, forth bitterness. And then seventhly, if we can't get them with our mouths, now we'll look at the word meanness. We'll get them with our hands and our fists. Look at me in verse 15. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths and the path of peace they have not known. So we'll get them with our hands. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Listen to this. At the turn of the 20th century, twice as many Americans of its citizens have been slain in private acts of murder than killed in all the wars in our entire history. The feet are the picture of readiness and swiftness to destroy men. I'll snuff out anyone who gets in my way in the corporate world and churches. Since there is no regard for God, there's no regard for his image bearers. 
It'll be an angry, hateful society with murders rising every year. Abortions will continue. It's just, I will kill and I will murder. And destruction and misery are in their paths. Destruction, this word carries the idea both of the sin and the punishment. And misery is the harm from man's acts of destruction against his fellow man. This is the emotional condition of the old saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. This is words will destroy and hurt and ruin people for lifetimes. Destruction and misery are in their paths. That's the fruit of a life lived without Christ. If you're watching this morning and that's the description of your life, it's just been misery and destruction no matter what I do. This breaks my heart because it, it destroys marriages. It destroys children. It gives lifetime diseases, disputes, grumblings, lying, murders, thefts, depression, fear, anxiety. It promises the good life, but it only destroys life. That's the end of every false promise for a life of sin. It's the cancer of the soul. Ask the unsaved what do you want out of life? And I hear it every time. I just want to be happy. And the, the picture here is all you're going to get is destruction and misery. It will never make you, it won't give you the good life. I'm offering you the good life. The path of peace they have not known. That's what they're wanting is peace. Visualize world peace and it's just not working. Isaiah 57, 20, the wicked are like the tossing sea. It cannot be quiet and its waters toss up refuge in mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. And so you just, you can never find peace. It's always right here, like Solomon said, and it just won't satisfy it. And this condition, the only thing you'll never find is peace. You can't, the Prince of Peace is offering you something this morning, but in this condition, you will never find peace. You will never find it. And then lastly, our misconduct misunderstanding, misdirection, mistakenness, our motives, there's none good, our mouths and our meanness. And our last point is just a misapprehension of God. A conclusion, I think, of all of it, of all the things we've just looked at is here's how I would describe it. There's just no fear of God before their eyes. It's a present tense verb. They're in, it's a genitive. There's no God kind of fear before their eyes. They're full of fear, but not a God kind of fear where the, where the writer says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not the one that has God and the new covenant. The fear will be put in my heart to reverence God and love him and fear and adore him and follow him. The almighty majestic God, the creator of all things, the sustainer, who all will stand before on the last day of judgment, has nothing to do with the way the unsaved live their lives. That is why they do everything that I just described. There's no fear of God before us in that state. Robert Haldane, the great commentator, said it is astonishing that men, while they acknowledge there is a God, should act without any fear of his displeasure. Yet this is their character. They fear a worm of the dust like themselves, humanity, but disregard the most High. Our whole world is built on fear of others and wanting their approval. He says, there's depravity. You're more worried about humanity than God. They're more afraid of man than of God, of his anger, his contempt, or ridicule. The fear of man prevents them from doing many things from which they are not restrained by the fear of God. They love not his character, not rendering to it that veneration which is due. They respect not his authority, such is the state of human nature while the heart is unchanged. <clears throat> the psalmist in 130 verse 4 says, who, who fears God to the way that they should? If thou should mark iniquities, O God, who could stand? But with thee there is forgiveness, and it's that word for atonement, that, that there's a way to have your sins forgiven by Jesus Christ, bearing them on a cross, that thou mayest be feared. And so the, the whole thing ties together that when you see the gospel of how to be remedied from the picture that I just gave you, 
there's a fear that will come into the heart that loves God and wants to move toward him in all of his glory and fullness and beauty. And so what I want you to see is here's your picture. And what Paul wants and what God wants is for you to finally look at it and say, this is me. What can I do? Well, will a little religion fix this? Being moral and going and being nice to people and serving at the Red Cross? Is there any way out of There's no spiritual Houdinis who can get out of this condition. There's only one way out. And in Romans 3.21, a but now, there's a salvation that God offers to bring us out of this condition. There's no other way out. And so I'm going to close our sermon this morning. I heard a message this week on Hosea that I just wanted to share in closing for the remedy of this condition. God says to Hosea, go take the woman Gomer and marry her and she's a prostitute for the most part. Hosea says, okay. And not long after his marriage, her, her, she has wayward feet and she doesn't stay faithful to Hosea. And they, they have children and, and she's fooling around on them. And one of his children, the Hebrew word is not mine. <laughs> not a good name for your child. Not mine. And it just gets worse and worse. And Gomer leaves, ends up leaving him and, and the kids and just takes off. And she just goes from one man to another. And finally, the last man sells her into slavery. And Hosea turns to God, kind of like, can you remind me again why you asked me to marry her? And God says, so that you'll know something about my relationship to you and Israel. You'll know what it's like to be me. Hosea, go where she's being bid on now. Go and, and purchase her freedom. Go, go buy her back. And, and now you're going to know what it's like to be me. And Gomer now, she's, she's in the next city he goes and she's being bid on. And when they would bid on them, they, they would strip him naked. And she's there naked and he has to come. And, and, and she hears Hosea's voice with all these bidding voices and it's her husband. And he purchases her and he gives to her her freedom. And then he takes his cloak and he covers her and says, now you can come home and be my wife. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful story? I love it. But it's nothing compared to what God has done for you. I want you to hear this this morning. There's none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside and together they become useless. There's none who does good. There's not even one. Their throat's an open grave and with their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips and their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness and their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths and the path of peace they have not known and there is just no fear of God before their eyes. Hosea just went to the next city to purchase his bride. But God had to come from heaven to earth to find this bride from hell that I just described this morning. You weren't seeking me. I had to come and seek you. And I just didn't reach into my pocket with a little bit of money to purchase you. I had to go hang on a cross and bear the wrath of God for all of your sin that was just described in Romans 3. I had to suffer and die in your pay, place, I had to pay the penalty for your sin. I was the one stripped naked and hung on a cross in your place so that now I can clothe you with my robe of righteousness that is offered to you this morning by faith. The righteousness of Christ, he will wrap you in that perfect garment so that now you can be righteous. Now you can come home with me. Relationship healed and your heart will be changed when you see a Savior like this. And when you see this, it's not go try harder. Go be a good person and not a bad person. Clean up. Go find God. But it's to see salvation as God seeking you. And I'm praying that He's seeking you this morning. That he, he is seeking you. 
and he's coming for you. And he did it at the infinite cost to himself of the death of his own son. And that this morning you would let this Savior save you from the pit that I just painted in Romans 3. And he'll take you and he'll wash you and cleanse you from all of your sin because he took the penalty for it. And then he'll wrap you in his righteousness so that when God looks at you now, he looks as if you're perfect. You're justified. You're righteous now before him. You're righteous. You understand. You seek him. And you bear good fruit. That will fill you with joy and a holy fear now to serve this God as the center of your heart, life, and affections the rest of your days. This is the only cure for Romans 3. There's no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved but through this Christ. So I pray, receive him this day. Call upon the name of the Lord from this pit and you will be saved. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for such a gospel. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. What a dark picture, and I pray that no one will try to turn it around or put an app on it this morning. Let everybody see who has not come to Christ. Let them see their own portrait this morning. Let them look at it in despair. Shut their mouths. Become accountable to you, God. Cry out for a Savior. The Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let them believe. Repent. Call and confess to this Christ. And be saved this morning. God, the misery and destruction have been in their paths. Maybe they're listening. It's been 20 years of misery and destruction or 80 just can't get out of it. They can't find peace. Oh God, let them call upon Christ, the Prince of Peace this morning, and find forgiveness for sin and reconciliation to the creator of the universe. Oh God, the healing of the soul. I pray, let everyone who hears my voice this morning believe and be saved. Amen.